and find um, uh, new opportunities to engage with audiences because obviously at the moment uh, it's really the only place that we can really safely and meaningfully speak to the people that we want to reach and as artists or creators as cultural practitioners that's our primary objective isn't it to be reaching out to people and to be touching our audiences and to be sharing our stories and our work so being able to pick up um, audiences where perhaps we haven't before, you know, experimenting with some of these new techniques is a, a good way to go. Um, I want to look at three different things. I hope you can all see that. It's, it might be, I don't know if you haven't already, maybe put yourself, put me up to a speaker view, hit the button in the top right hand corner of Zoom because then you'll be able to read my uh, titles as well as I go along. Uh, I'll be, there's not a lot up there that you necessarily need to read if you can't see it or you're watching on a smaller device. But um, uh, what we're going to be talking about this evening, I'm going to break the session down into three separate categories. First off, I want to start exploring the what and why. Why should we be sharing our work online and what sort of things can we do? Some of the questions that we need to be asking ourselves before we get too far along the lines of making decisions about which way to go. I want to think a little bit about stagecraft, something which is uh, of the, the greatest of importance at the moment, um, especially while people are producing work from home. There's a whole range of different things that can be done to help ensure some simple techniques to make sure that we're spending the same amount of time and energy and rigor on uh, our stagecraft online as we would be if we were working from home, uh, working in a theater or a gallery. And finally, I just want to um, look then at some of the, the technical nuts and bolts. So we'll get into the sort of the nitty gritty about what sort of uh, cameras you might use, what sort of equipment you might have, what kind of things you can do from a very early entry point all the way up to some quite uh, you know, quite large, quite advanced, quite sophisticated um, projects as well. So in, in the work that I've done as a digital producer over the last 10 years or so, I've covered a whole range of different sorts of projects from theatre events to massive outdoor spectacles to conferences to events, all within the cultural sector. And the things, some of the things that I've learned along the way have influenced the choices and the decisions about how we do the sorts of things that we do. And really, this is one of the sort of the first opening points for this. Um, we want to think about how you want to engage with your audience online. So we're going right to this first bit here, the what and the why, straight into that. How do you want to engage with your audiences online? Now, um, as I appreciate that, I haven't actually, um, haven't started off by asking you all where you're from and what sort of field you're in. I've had a little bit of a list. So I know that some of you are artist makers, some of you are producers, some of you are people from a variety of different, different backgrounds. So I'm going to talk quite widely, partly because if any of you were on my uh, production management talk, I genuinely believe that actually across the sector, we are all creative practitioners to some degree and all have a, a duty and a responsibility within the sort of facilitation of creative practice. So we'll talk about it from that sort of perspective to get started. So thinking first as a creative practitioner, if you want to uh, share your work online, I'm just going to do this so you can see me a bit better. Um, what is it? That your what is it that makes you unique? What is it about your work that makes the product that you're selling, that you're sharing, the stories that you're telling, the way that you're doing it? What is it about that that makes it unique? The reason that we need to start with that question is because that then leads into the opportunity to start thinking about how you can re-engineer that special thing, that unique thing about your work, how you can re-engineer it into something which will translate into a format that's uh, engaging and approachable for an online audience. As creative practitioners, that relationship between performer and audience, between artwork and audience, between uh, you know, the, the configuration of our space, the way that we present our work, when we're dealing with live audiences, whether it's in theatres or galleries or festivals or in the streets or however we're presenting our work, we've always been very uh, deliberate in our thinking, always very intentional in our thinking about 
that relationship between performer and audience. And when we move online, it's no different. You have to think in exactly the same way about where your audience is, how they're engaging with the work, what sort of things you want them to see, what sort of things you want them not to see, how you want them to be able to interpret that. So in the same way as in a theatre, you might think about sight lines, you might think about lighting and sound, all those sorts of things we'll come on to. We need to be thinking in the same sort of way with this. So start off with that question, that very first question, which is what makes your work unique and what is it that you can do to re-engineer that uniqueness into a way that makes it trans transmittable in an online format. Now, when we're thinking about the, the way that people in our audiences, when they're online, will be watching work, this is where this discussion, this thought process, this, this um, uh, methodology needs to start. So if you're in a theatre, thinking about if you're in a theatre, you would understand the, you know, the, 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 the walls of a set perhaps behind you, the, the imaginary fourth wall in front of you with the audience uh, in the, the space out, out beyond, beyond there. In a gallery, it might be that you're creating an environment where people can walk in and they can uh, you know, get, see, see the different sides, the different aspects of the thing. But what you're doing all the time in that sort of setting is that you're controlling the environment that the audience are in. In a theatre, you turn the lights off at 7.30, house lights go down, music starts, stage lights go up. You're entirely in control of that environment. People are sat in rows. If you can think back and remember a time when it was okay to have people sat in rows in a darkened room together for an evening. Um, it seems a long time ago now. But um, audiences engage in a very particular way in those sorts of spaces, and you're very much in control of that sort of thing. Now, when you're watching work online, you will all have done this in some shape or form, whether it's over the last few months in lockdown or outside of that time. And you might find yourself that you're sat looking at your laptop screen. It might be that you've got a smart TV in your living room. It might be that you're watching on an iPad or your iPhone. It might be that you're on the train. Any host of different environments, different uh, settings and contexts. So as a creator, it's all the more important at that point to start thinking about how you can re-engineer your work. So if someone is watching on a tiny small screen or they're watching on a laptop or they're watching in a, a noisy train carriage or they're watching in a way which is not necessarily at a designated time in a designated place. What is it that you can do to your work to help them tune into it, to help them engage with it, to help them really think about what it is you're saying and why you're saying it and why that's important? Yeah. So think about where your audience are. Think about how you can re-engineer your work to help them. And we'll talk about some of these sorts of tips and tricks along the way. It's worth thinking about as well, while we're in these sorts of early stages of questions, think about, um, think about why it is that you're wanting to share your work online. Think about why it is you're wanting to share your work and think about whether those motivations change or compromise the work. Now, there's a whole range of reasons. There's as many reasons as you can think of um, for sharing your work online. It could be anything from uh, generating new audiences where people perhaps geographically are outside the reach of your, uh, your venue or your event. It might be to do with generating new audiences uh, where there's a shared interest. So if you think about, you know, the, perhaps the work that you're doing, it might be that there's only in Bradford 200 people. There's only ever going to be 200 people in Bradford who are interested in your work. But in every other city, there's another 200 people across the world that would be interested in your work. So it might not just be about geography. It might be about interest as well. So there's this wealth of audiences out there that either, you know, are not accessing your work because it's not nearby or they're not accessing your work because it's not of interest to them or, you know, they're not in the right, you're not targeting the right people in the right way. So there's, there's just two very quick reasons for sharing your work online. Another might be around access. There's, you know, there's a lot being said in recent months just about actually how much, um, 
opportunity there is all of a sudden for people who might struggle to get into a venue, people who might struggle to get to theatres or engage with that sort of environment that now are, have a wealth, a whole, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of opportunities to watch work online in a way that perhaps they didn't um, uh, just only a few months ago. Now, all of these things, very legitimate reasons for sharing work online, it might actually be that you want to look at generating some revenues from it as well. You know, there's, uh, you know, perhaps ways of selling your work, perhaps, you know, to, to generate uh, some income as well. And we'll talk about that in a bit as well. So with all those reasons, all those things, all those reasons that you might be taking your work online, you then get to a point of having to think about whether any of that is going to compromise the the style of the work the integrity of the work if the work's about outreach but you're charging for it online is that the best way of doing it if it's stories about bradford but people are watching it in uh, you know in the uh, in i don't know in leicester or in birmingham does that change anything about the content is there a way that you need to uh, alter the some of the themes or the way the themes are interpreted if you're spreading to a wider audience. So I guess the, you know, the sort of the, the, the key thing with this is that you'll often have to, as part of this reimagining and re-engineering, be thinking too about content, thinking about the motivations, what you're hoping to achieve with your sharing and think about that content, think about those themes, think about the story that you're trying to tell and whether or not that's something that's gonna translate well. Um, uh, into an online uh, online forum, uh, into a platform, onto a platform where people in any sort of setting, in any sort of context could be watching it. One of the interesting things to um, think about, the um, almost everybody at some point will have seen an NT Live um, screening. Uh, uh, over the last few months, of course, they've been making them available free, which has been great. Um, but if anybody's watched them at home, perhaps on their TV, perhaps on their computer. This is a great example of why you need to be thinking in advance about your audience and where your audience are watching from. Now, remember the NT Live stuff, they made that available at a ticketed price to audiences in cinema, to, um, to audiences in cinemas who had bought a ticket, who turned up on a specific night, who had been able to uh, get, go into a darkened room at a designated time and sit in a row, not dissimilar to the experience they would have if they were in a theatre. So however sort of generous the National Theatre might say they are in terms of geographical reach and things, fundamentally there was a, a, a serious financial consideration in what they were doing. And so as a consequence, the way that they shot the work and the way that they edited the work, the way they framed the work and the way they promoted the work was effectively to recreate the experience of viewing it in a theater as you know to a certain extent so you've got a giant screen in front of you the size of the uh, the theater stage potentially depending on what sort of cinema you're in giant screen in front of you so if they do a wide shot of that whole stage what you're seeing is effectively what you would see if you were in the middle of the auditorium at the national yeah now obviously they do cut in and things like that but if you've watched this at home now, if you've seen any of this content over the last few months, and perhaps you've watched it on a laptop screen or your iPad or your phone, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, it was all right, but I'm not really sure it worked, you know. And it's that, it's that thing it is simply because when they set out to produce that work, they produced it as a piece of work to be viewed in a dark room with 500 other people at a designated time in theater rows as if you were in a theater environment. So they hadn't necessarily put that same sort of thought and rigor into imagining how someone might watch it if they were on a busy train on the way home from, a, uh, from work, listening on the headphones, watching on a, a three inch wide screen. Some of the decisions and choices that you might make about production and about the, the way that you're sharing your work, even simple things like the duration, some of these things might be influenced when you start to think about uh, your audience and how they're engaging with it. So this is still where we are. We're still thinking about audiences, how we're engaging with audiences and what they're seeing. Now, if we go back to this point, uh, I am slightly distracted by the chat here, which is fine. Keep the chat going. I will come back and read those and answer the questions along the way, but just uh, at the uh, uh, suitable points for that sort of thing. So next question up. 
is it important that your work is viewed live as it's happening? Now, we're still thinking about how we're engaging with our audience and we're still thinking about how we might be sharing our work and how we might be uh, engaging with people in different contexts and different environments. Until we answer these questions, we can't get to a point where we're making legitimate technical or practical decisions from an informed perspective. This is why I'm starting out with this stuff. This is why we're going down the route first of going, you know, where are your audience? Who are your audience? How are they watching? Is, so this question, is it important that the work is viewed as live as it's happening? Now with that question, there's lots of reasons why you might want it to work like that. So what I'm talking about here is a distinction between a live stream with an audience who are watching the event live as it's being performed versus a, uh, a live, uh, perhaps a live recording. So something which has been filmed earlier, which is then broadcast as if it's live. Okay, so there's a subtle distinction there, but we're talking about audience and performer effectively being in the same virtual space at the same time together. Now, one of the main reasons for doing something live, and this cuts across all sorts of different uh, disciplines and different things, is that it might be referring to the time. It might be that actually, uh, you know, there are, there's enough clues in the text, in the story, for people to know if it was recorded yesterday and is being viewed today. Outdoor work, you'll find, you know, it's certainly doing outdoor work in the UK. I did a, a couple of uh, projects over last year, one of which took place in uh, Coventry, a big outdoor spectacle that took place in Coventry. Uh, we filmed the rehearsal, the dress rehearsal, fortunately, on a dry, bright evening. The next day, uh, torrential rain, high winds, the show was cancelled. We still streamed it at the designated time as if it was live. But of course, audiences knew full well that it wasn't live because anybody that had seen the weather or had been on Twitter and had seen the announcements and seen the notices about the fact that torrential rain had cancelled the play, you know, they're of course are immediately going to know that it's not live and happening in that moment in that way. So you have to think about whether that's important and whether that's sort of, whether there's anything in the content that you're sharing that would be affected or, you know, whether there's any implications for that. Are the reasons for sharing your work live as it's happening? And this is particularly useful if you're thinking about something um, like an R&D project, something where you're trying to garner some audience feedback, perhaps something where you're going to try and uh, uh, perhaps there's a post-show discussion, you know, those sorts of things. Anywhere where you can actually uh, see some benefit in having that uh, sort of that dialogue going on with the audience while you're um, that dialogue going on with the audience while you're performing. So whether that's in the chat box alongside on the screen, whether it's in uh, Facebook comments, whether it's on Twitter, you know, there's uh, you know, opportunities for people to engage with the, the work while it's happening. And, uh, you know, it might be particularly useful for R&D. There's all sorts of other ways. Uh, many, many, many years ago now, feels like many years ago now, I did a, uh, a live stream with Cardboard Citizens. Now, Cardboard Citizens, for those who don't know, are a theatre who work with... Um, uh, the uh, with homeless people to create forum theatre. Now, forum theatre, you probably are all, certainly I know that some of you seeing some of the names on screens will be able to define this much better than I do. Uh, forum theatre is where uh, it's a methodology for exploring, uh, you know, some, some particularly chewy issues, things that, you know, perhaps social injustice, that kind of thing. Now, with forum theatre, the performers will play out part of the play and then it will be open to the audience to come up with suggestions, to come onto stage, to take the place of the central protagonist and uh, rework sections of the play to see if they can get a different outcome. So it's usually around sort of exploring themes and issues and things like that. Hopefully that was near enough as a, as a description. Now with that and online live streaming, this was, this was probably seven or eight years ago. So long enough ago for this to be a relatively new area. We set up a, a chat room alongside the live stream. So we had an audience in the theater, we had an audience online and the audience online were able to engage in exactly the same way with that forum theater process to a point where after the play had played out, they were able to then go into the chat room 
put in comments and questions which were picked up by someone in the room who then would go on to stage to take the role of the protagonist and they would in the audience online remotely wherever they were were still able to experience that kind of that you know the 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 hands-on nature of that to a point so you know that the we're going back to this question really about whether it's important for the audience to be there and live with you when you're doing it. And there's a number of reasons. That. I mean, that forum theater example was a particularly good, um, good reason for doing that. It, it does though kind of raise the question then back to this, whether it needs to be live at the moment that you're doing it or whether it's something, uh, ooh, got fake, uh, whether it's something that could be played out as if it's live. So, with the forum theatre, with that uh, protagonist uh, being taken off and replaced by someone with the working through issues, watching over stuff, obviously it, it couldn't, you couldn't have pre-recorded that and played it out as if it's live. But sometimes it might be worth um, thinking about whether a pre-recorded work shared at a designated time could still generate audience dialogue, could still generate feedback and conversation could still generate a level of buzz about an event which helps to you know convey a message helps to share the story helps to helps to to sort of bolster audiences as well because if you think about it in these sorts of terms if you post up a video on youtube at any you know any given time you know there's you have to think about what the sort of what's the call to action then a video posted up at youtube that's available forever will not generate the same sort of interest and engagement in the same sort of time frame as something which is this event is happening at this time on this day on this channel be there or you're going to miss it now it might be exactly the same product but if you're thinking about building audiences and you're thinking about building a buzz around the activity that you're doing and you're thinking about trying to uh, encourage engagement in a way that perhaps is more like the conversation that would happen in the bar at the foyer in the foyer at the at the theater during the interval or after the show or you're trying to you know to create some of that sort of shared collective effervescence around a live event then Doing it at a designated time, whether it's actually happening live or not, can be a really effective way of doing that. And there is a sort of a small added bonus in this, which as the creative practitioner, if you are pre-recording something and then playing it out at a later point, but you're still making it a, an event, you can be there in the audience, with the audience, following the chat, answering questions, engaging with the conversation as it's happening in a way which of course you wouldn't be able to do while you're on stage. So, you know, there's, there's pros and cons. And the key thing to say with this, really important to say with this is that there's actually, there is no right and wrong in any of this. You have to go back to that initial question, which is how are you going to, or how are you wanting to engage with your audience? What is it you're wanting to say? And what's the best mechanism for re-engineering this, um, your work in a way which makes it, uh, you know, engaging and compelling for an online audience. So think about that call to action. Think about what the next um, thing is. The uh, like any other um, live work, like any event, you still need to be marketing your online work in a way which will bring people along. Now, they, I, I looked this up. Um, there is currently something in the region just in this little bit in excess of four and a half billion people who have access to the internet at the moment now that's far more people than live in bradford who are likely to come to a venue in bradford to see one of your shows um it's a far bigger audience than you know most people would be able to reach the mechanism for getting online for getting access to your work is in the hands of four and a half billion people worldwide, but they will only come to your work if they know about it. So the same principles about marketing, about messaging, about social media, about getting the word out and about through your networks is as crucial 
for generating audiences online as it is for live events, for theatre shows, for exhibitions, for, you know, for whatever it is you're doing. That same principle really, really has to be at the heart of it, that you have to talk to your audience in advance of the event, plenty of time in advance of the event, make sure that you're converting their interest into action, you know, follow through those, all those stepping stones and all those models that you've learned over the years about marketing, uh, marketing your, your work. So getting to a point where you're recognizing that there is this vast audience out there, but also they're an audience that will still be divided in interests, in demographic, in engagement level of engagement you know just because there's four you know there's four and a half billion people out there chances are not many of them are actually that into theater you know i mean our live audience stats tell us that anyway and you know i say that as someone who absolutely loves theater but you know you wouldn't find me at a football match on a saturday afternoon people like different things for different reasons and that's absolutely fine so you have to still segment your audience a little bit when you're looking at that number when you're looking at the potential when you're looking at the opportunity there you still have to be able to break it down into manageable chunks and go okay this work is really interesting and relevant to this audience in this area of this age of this category what's the best mechanism for talking to them what's the best mechanism for getting that message out to them now that might well be the same sort of mechanisms as you use when you're doing geographically based work. When I say that, I mean work which is based in a town, in a venue, in one country, yeah? So it might be the same sort of principles that you're applying, but don't forget to do that for the online audiences. Now, interesting example with this. A few years ago, I, uh, over a number of years, um, regularly live streamed theatre shows for the Black Theatre Live Network. Now, this was a network of nine uh, producing theatres from around the country. Uh, it was people like Tara Arts and Theatre Royal Stratford East and Bury St Edmunds and uh, Derby, a whole, whole host of um, different venues. Each year they would produce a, a play by um, a, a, you know, a company or a writer who needed some more mainstream exposure and they would put it on in their venues and it would tour to nine venues. Every year, in one of those venues, we would do a live stream of the show. Now, it might be counterintuitive to think, well, actually, does that not cannibalise audiences from the other venues? Is that not pulling people away? But actually, quite the opposite was the case. What we found, and the way that they treated that live stream, was they looked at it as being the 10th venue in their tour. So it sort of takes a little bit of thinking about to get to that point. But if you think about the time and energy and resource that each of those partner venues put into promoting the show to their audience, they put the same time and energy into promoting the show to the audience that would be engaging with the work online. And the consequence was, the result was, and these were all sort of mid, small to mid-scale venues, was that the live stream audience was equal to and sometimes greater than the number of people in the audience in the venues at the time when the show was on. So effectively what you're seeing is you're seeing, you know, something which is giving you a 10th audience, another bite of a different audience in a different place, but you have to put in the time and energy and resource into making that something which is possible, something that can happen. So carrying on. That hopefully covers off some of the what and why. These, just to recap, questions that you need to ask yourself before you get to a point, um, uh, before you get to the point of making any decisions about how or when or where or what kit you need or what platform you're hosting on or anything like that. So just getting to some of that fundamental, thinking about your audience um, and going through those sorts of how are people engaging, what are you trying to say, why are you doing it, what's the motivation? Hopefully we'll give you the foundations, really solid foundations to move on to the next step, the next bits along the way. Before I move on, does anybody want to ask any questions specifically about what we've covered? We're gonna go on to next stagecraft and the technical nuts and bolts, but um, just while I have a glass of water, I'll give you a minute to um, think. Um, there was a question from Joyce. She said, how did you put the words next to yourself on Zoom? So it says what and why in stagecraft. <laughs> um, 
I'll come on to that. I don't want to give away no. section three before we're ready, okay? So you'll just have to be patient, Joyce, I'm afraid. So, um, okay, well, let's, um, let's crack on into this. So, this next section, stagecraft, thinking about stagecraft, <clears throat> What I want to be thinking about is the framing of your work. I want to look at, I'm doing this thing again, I'm dividing this into three sections, I'm afraid, that's just, you know, habit. <laughs> uh, framing of your work, um, props and dressings, and then we'll look a little bit at lighting and sound. So in the stagecraft section, these are the things that we're gonna cover off. Um, but first off, what do we mean by stagecraft in the context of digital work? Um, I suppose what it is, is that we need to be thinking about how we can be really intentional in the way that we're sharing our work. If you think about what it is you do when you go into a theatre, think about what it is that you, um, the time and energy that's put into um, a production week, where you know, you're already in the pre-production process, you'll have spent a number of weeks with a creative team designing sets, designing costumes, thinking about lighting, thinking about sound, um, thinking about the, the way props are used. You'll have spent time in a rehearsal room with a director, uh, you know, with a specialist skill set, looking at how to convey the emotion in the work, to, uh, to perform the work in a way which is going to best draw people in. When you get onto stage in the production week, then you go into those technical rehearsals, you're going through, you know, step by step, cue by cue, rehearsing everything, testing everything, checking everything, making sure that everything that you do is done in a way which really best tells the story in a way which um, the audience are going to engage with in that context. And also in a way that's really intentional. You know, if you think about some of the sort of stuff that designers do when they're thinking about perhaps a period piece, they're very deliberate about what can be seen on stage. They're very deliberate about the props and how the props are used. And there's a specialism in that. There's something which is really, really important to consider. And that actually is what helps transport the audience. It's what helps transform a uh, you know, the uh, sort of uh, rushed person coming in at the end of a busy day at work, when they arrive into the theatre and they sit in their seat, it transports them to a different time, to a different place. It takes them out of themselves for long enough so they can listen, so they can engage, so they can learn, so they can feel. And all, you know, this is why we do the work. This is why we produce creative, creative work, isn't it, at the end of the day. So with that, that rigour, that attention to detail, we need to now be thinking about what that means when we're sharing work online, okay? Um, the, I suppose the key starting point for this at the moment, and um, uh, just by way of a little bit of context, over the last, um, pretty much since lockdown started, I've had a weekly um, piece of work that I've done for Payne's Plow, who are a new writing company, um, where every week they've been commissioning writers to write and record in their own context, new work. So new writing, new theatre pieces. And, you know, they've been great. The quality of the writing has been excellent. What hasn't necessarily been excellent is the way that those films have arrived, which is why I've been brought on board by Payne's Plow to basically take each week you know, between four or five or six or seven uh, films from writers and look at them and go, okay, well, you know, I can cut that bit off there at the beginning so they don't reach into the screen and press the go button. You don't see that happening. We can trim in the, the thing a little bit so you don't see that there's a, a, you know, a scrappy bit of paper stuck to the wall behind them. Just, you know, thinking about those sorts of stagecraft issues um, and sort of trying to engineer out some of that lack of rigor. And, you know, sometimes I've been able to do it, sometimes I haven't. There are certain things that you can't fix. So the more that you can do when you're creating your work in the room at this time, in whatever context it is, the more attention you can pay to the stagecraft, the better. And this, you know, this is exactly the same whether you're working from home now or whether at some point in the future, 
we're out in the world again and are in uh, galleries, in uh, event spaces, in theatres, in, you know, wherever we're sharing our work from with live audiences, exactly the same thing applies to how you might take that live content and convert it digitally in, into a format that is shared online. Um, simple thing, simple thing to start off with. And this really is a sort of um, uh, just an example of you are an artist producing a monologue which is going to go to uh, to an audience online talking about your experiences in lockdown. We've all seen loads of them over the last three months. Um, simple, very simple starting point. Get your camera to eye level. Okay. Seems like a really simple thing. Um, uh, if you can get your camera to uh, that button, sorry, that button. Uh, if you can get your camera to eye level, what you're doing is you're giving the audience watching you a more natural experience of engaging with another person. If you think about when you stand and have a conversation with someone, you might bump into a friend in the street, whatever it is, a colleague at work, when you're stood opposite someone, chances are you're going to broadly be within the same sort of height of each other. It sounds like such a minor thing and it's one of those things that nobody thinks about and we've all been on Zoom um, conversations and I'm not going to pick on anybody on screen, although I did this the other day with picking out a few examples, you there, you there, um, of people on screen and how we uh, have got used to a sort of a new aesthetic where it's okay for the camera to be a tabletop looking up your nose. Um, they, it's just not a natural way of engaging with another person. If you can be on the same eye level with them um, and look directly at them, through the camera, then effectively what you're doing is that you're creating the most natural mechanism for sharing your content. People won't even think about it. They won't even uh, register necessarily, but subconsciously there'll be something, if you're at a jaunty angle, there'll be something which is just jarring, something which just doesn't quite feel right for them. So, um, just thinking about that sort of thing. And actually, it doesn't take a lot of complicated equipment or technical resources to do it. I'm just gonna show you this little film that I recorded earlier. Um, I've just changed settings for a moment to show you what's a very familiar looking scene. We've all had this in recent weeks while we've been in lockdown, staring up at someone from a tabletop on a Zoom call, on a Skype meeting, looking up to the corner of their room, often in less than ideal conditions with backlight coming in through the window, those sorts of things. Now, to a certain extent on a, a Zoom call or a Skype meeting, it's not ideal, but it's not the end of the world. But when someone's sharing their work online, they're doing a rehearsed reading, they're perhaps sharing some uh, a monologue, a little bit more thought perhaps could be put into the framing with some relatively simple techniques employed to make sure that the work's being presented in the best way. In the same room, at the same time, I've been able to film this footage, just thinking a little bit about where I'm putting myself and where I'm putting the camera and how I'm addressing the audience through the lens and on the screen at the receiver's end. You can change the the look and feel of something from something which is just, you know, is, is fine perhaps for, uh, you know, an office meeting or something like that, but isn't necessarily the way that you would want to present yourself if you were working um, uh, on a, you know, presenting uh, creative work or theatrical work, if you were pre presenting new writing, if you were uh, sharing uh, you know, I don't know, any any sort of creative practice, the, the, that sort of that Zoom call framing isn't necessarily the right way of doing things. So with just a little bit of thought and attention, you can actually get some, um, uh, get a little, you know, get, make some minor changes to bring about a, a better, better result there, a more natural result, a way that people is more engaging for your audiences, thinking back all the time to your audiences and how you're engaging with your audiences. So now, that basically, that was just shot on an iPhone. So effectively, all I had was my phone in my hand. I held it up, uh, you know, and it was really just to do with the position of myself in the room and uh, where the position of the phone was that made all the difference there. Okay. So going back to this. So we, we're talking about framing of the work. Now, one of the things to think about if you're framing work 
uh, your shooting work in live space, so perhaps with an audience in, there's a number of things that you need to think about there as well. Similar sort of things to do with framing. So moving on beyond this lockdown period where we're sharing work from home, when you're framing your work in a theatre, it's worth thinking about where your camera positions might be. Okay, we're going to come on to talk about what sort of cameras you can use and how you might be able to uh, utilize different styles of photography or different styles of filmmaking to draw your audience in closer to the action. But from a very practical point of view, think about where your cameras might be within the space. I have seen and had to edit around a context where uh, we were filming a live event and because of uh, the, the, it was a full house in the audience, we had to put um, cameras just in the aisles on the outside edge of the audience, on audience left and right. Consequence was that at certain points, looking across the stage, those camera positions were just outside the sight lines that the designer had designed into the set. So actually the consequence most of the time was, you know, you might have just seen a little bit of dark stripe down the side of something rather than, you know, the sort of designed bit of it. But at one particular point in the show, uh, an ASM, an assistant stage manager, standing in the wings, hands a prop on stage. Now the audience couldn't see any of that, but we being a meter and a half outside the edge of the audience got a great shot of the stage manager handing the prop on stage, which of course then if we had shown that would have destroyed the magic of that moment. It was a, it was a pantomime. So, you know, you can uh, imagine what that could have been or how that might have worked. It's the sort of thing that, you know, those sight lines, uh, those audience positions have been designed and have been thought about that stagecraft, that rigor has been put in place um, to, um, uh, to, you know, to, to ensure that the audience aren't distracted by things that they shouldn't be seeing. Um, and, you know, that's as much as uh, it's a, as much the same thing as as when you're at home as well filming is that, you know, what do you want in shot? What's in the background? What sort of things are um, perhaps distracting from the story you're telling. So when we're thinking on moving on to this sort of props and dressings question, um, obviously in a theatre, as I've said, we spend a lot of time controlling that sort of thing. But when you've positioned yourself and you've thought about your camera and you're creating some work, you need to then think about what's actually behind you. What's in shot that you might not want your audience to see how much of the, the, the environment that you're filming do you have direct control over? And it might be that you need to position yourself in a way that you have very little space behind you. So what you can do with that space is that you can be really thorough in ensuring that it's all, uh, you know, the, the mechanisms, the, the tools that you want to help tell the story, to convey the mood, to portray character. If you're filming in on location, you're filming in a, a venue perhaps, or you're, you know, you're filming at home, you want to be sure that the, what the camera is seeing really helps tell the story that you want to tell. These, you know, the props, costume, setting, all those sorts of things, they're all tools that the creative practitioner has in their arsenal to make sure that they're uh, transporting that audience and telling the story, engaging the audience in the way that you, that you want them to with the work that you're sharing. So be intentional. And if you can't be with everything that's behind you, find a way of turning your camera around, find a, you know, come closer to a wall, find a way of doing it, you know, uh, zoom in. So, you know, that you're not getting so much background behind you. Think about what you're wearing in the same way as you would if you were thinking about a costume on stage. Think about, you know, perhaps logos on clothes that you might not normally think about, which actually when you're sharing work online might be something which is going to compromise the integrity of the work that you're doing or the message that you're saying, those sorts of things. When you're portraying a character as a performer, um, uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about that sort of sort of thing. You really need to be making sure that you're being consistent and coherent in the choices that you're making. So the crucial thing for this really is about being intentional. Okay. Um, moving on, 
the next bit of this section really was just to think about um, lighting and sound. And if you think about the way that um, people use lighting and sound in theatre or in events or in festivals or in the, the, the creative artworks that we produce, um, it's a really powerful tool for creatives in conveying atmosphere, in creating mood, in helping to give a setting or context to the work. Um, to, you know, to give a sense of uh, movement or moment, uh, you know, momentum, to give a, uh, you know, to, to, to draw people's focus on a stage. One of the key, key, um, one of the key things that lighting is used for on stage is to give something form, to direct the attention of the audience to a particular place at a particular time. And when we're working on film, we're working on digital, when we're working from home even, just being that little bit more um, deliberate about the choices we're making with lighting can really help. Now, it doesn't need, crucial thing to say, is it doesn't need um, complex theatrical lighting, it doesn't need uh, film lighting equipment or resource, it doesn't necessarily need anything than what you might have at your disposal already, because the key thing to remember is that anything that's happening beyond, you know, just poke to the right bit, beyond the, uh, there and here, anything that's happening outside those bits, nobody needs to know. None of you have the faintest idea where I am or what the room is that I'm sat in or what's going on behind me and to the sides of me and what I'm surrounded with. Now, within that, I could have a variety of lighting sources. I could have um, sound sources. I could be utilizing the space to create a mood or an atmosphere or to give an indication of time or context or any of those sorts of things. And actually it might be that I just have a, you know, a desk lamp off to this side to make sure there's enough light on my face. It might be that there's a window over there letting in natural light. It might be that just above me here, there are lights in the ceiling which are helping to give just a, a general, uh, you know, illumination across the, across my scene. And in any sort of um, sharing online or sharing of creative work online, you can use those same sort of principles. Think about what the light's saying, what it's for, what it's doing. Now, the light that we're looking at here, where I am, is warm. Uh, well, no, it's sort of, it's a bright light light bright light light it's a bright you know it's a cooler light i guess which you know i sort of deliberately i say deliberately i mean it's basically it's the lights that were here i did turn a few lights off to make sure that it wasn't too bright but with this light this light is a good light for presenting work to camera it's a good light for presenting work which is training work if i was reading a uh, you know a bedtime story for children online this would be the wrong light because it's bright and it's cool and it's in you know it's sort of it's attention grabbing and it's you know it's exactly those as simple as that those sorts of things so think about the mood think about the atmosphere think about the things that you could do to transform the way that you're um presenting the work so um the same has to be said for you know um uh, for sound and things. Uh, just sorry, just a final thought on lighting, particularly if you're filming on a computer or a phone. There's not quite so much control over the sort of settings that the way the camera responds, especially on something like if you're using something like Zoom, a way over the way the camera responds. The way that the, the camera will always try and pull out the detail in what seems to be the best lit area of the uh, of the frame and you know what seems to be in the center of the frame so if you are um if you have bright light behind you yeah with bright light behind you your face will be in darkness and the consequences is that the camera will look at it and it'll go well can i try and pull a bit more detail out of that and what you'll end up with is it'll it'll alter the settings which have mean that you might have a very grainy um grainy face and a very sort of bright halo behind you because it'll be drawing out sort of effectively as if it's a camera opening up the iris uh, digitally that is opening up the iris to try and let more light in and the consequence of that is it blows out some detail and you just end up with very grainy so if you're getting low quality footage from filming on a computer or a 
uh, or a phone, then really the thing to do is check first whether your light levels are sufficient. Good light, you're more likely to get a better image. It's a very, very simple equation, um, especially with filming, well, in any case, but especially filming on um, phones or computers. Next up, just want to have a little bit of a think about sound and the same sort of principles apply. In theatre, we're deliberate, we're intentional, we use music, we use atmosphere, we use uh, sound effects to create uh, moments on stage to tell the audience where they are. They're in a park. They're in a 1950s living room with the radio on in the background. They're in a busy restaurant kitchen. You know, we, you can use sound to create those environments. It's one of the most powerful tools at the, uh, at the disposal of the creator practitioner. When we're sharing our work online, there's as much which is distracting as there is which is, uh, is good to convey the story. I, I did a, a, a workshop, not dissimilar to this, a, a few weeks ago, and I did it, uh, uh, did it from a different, a different room at that point. And it, we actually had builders working 20 yards away um, across the road. So all the way through the talk, all you could hear was people chopping up concrete blocks and banging scaffolding and that kind of thing. And really, you know, that wasn't the the sound world that I really wanted to create for that occasion. Now, yeah, in reality, it was fine because it was just a little bit of online training. But if you're thinking about uh, sharing a monologue, doing a reading, uh, presenting some work, you need that sound world that you're in to be the sound world that you want the audience to hear to help them engage with the, um, the, the work, to best utilize those tools and techniques that are at the creative practitioner's disposal to create mood, atmosphere, time, context, all those sorts of things. So um, as well as building in intentional sound, and we'll come on to some of the technicalities of that in a minute, as well as building in intentional sound, what you want to do is you want to think about how you can get rid of unintentional sound. Is the dog jumping around in the background barking? Is there a crying baby in the next room? Is there a fridge? just next to you which is humming um at that low level in the background have you got fluorescent lights on which might be buzzing you know all these sorts of things are just you know minor minor distractions is there a lot of traffic outside yeah, I, I have seen monologue about life in lockdown about how deserted the streets are it was recorded by someone who you know perhaps could have afforded to come to this um uh, this presentation sound of traffic streaming up and down the streets outside noise of people chatting. They're talking about how desolate the streets are and the, the sound world that was created because of the environment that they were in didn't marry up. It, there was a, this, this conflict there, which just, you know, sort of just jarred really. So there's some simple things like that to think about. Think about eliminating uh, extraneous noise. Think about where you are and the sound of the room that you're in as well. Now, I'm quite uh, fortunate here. I, I think that this space that I'm in is relatively acoustically dry. It's not too boomy. It's not too uh, resonant or echoey. So hopefully um, you're able to hear what I'm saying and you're able to hear it clearly. And there's no sort of distracting uh, resonance to the space, which is drawing your attention away. When you're um, when you're recording work online, when you're recording, uh, you know, it might be that you're recording voice work even, there's all sorts of little simple things that you can do. Find a room which has more soft furnishing, somewhere that has curtains and, you know, duvets, that kind of thing. Um, any hard surface will act as a mirror for sound. So if, you're, if the sound that you're getting sounds boxy, or like you're, you know, you know, like you're in a uh, an underground tunnel or a cave or something like that. If the sound is sounding like that, think about the space that you're in. Think about the walls that are around you, and think about what could you do to those. Think about them in like mirrors, bouncing the sound back to where your microphone is. And is there any way of baffling that off, of blocking that off? It sounds a ridiculous thing to say, but if you are working on a laptop and your laptop is just in front of you then could you build up some cushions and some pillows around the laptop? So effectively, all the laptop is getting is the sound that's coming from you directly to it. Is there a way that you could um, 
work facing an open wardrobe sounds ridiculous again you know you have to think about these the, all these sorts of contexts so if you're presenting work to a laptop or a phone and you've got an open wardrobe in front of you a lot of that sound that might bounce around the space is going to be absorbed straight away into your jumpers and your coats and you know your 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 winter uh, winter clothes in the in the wardrobe it's it it's a very rudimentary way of doing things but it's very very effective and it can make the difference because really the last thing that we want is we want we don't want anything to get in the way of how the audience is engaging with the work this is coming back full circle to that thing again where thinking about how where your audience is you you haven't got control about the environment that they're in so the more you can do to control the environment that you're in the better chance you've got of making them hear and listen and understand the work in the way that you're intending it. Okay. The other thing, which is a, um, uh, is really sort of a, a, just a minor, minor little aside, is that if you're working with paper, I've just got some notes in front of me that I, um, I'm using. If you're working with paper, chances are the paper is closer to the microphone when you're turning your pages than your voices. So, you know, you might be getting this sort of thing even if you're not seeing it on camera you know you'll i've you'll always know when an actor turns their page because you're hearing you know, the business of that going on um because paperwork is closer to the camera than their voices perhaps so think about those sorts of things um with all this sort of stuff be intentional be intentional that's the you know as we would in theater Think about that thing that I just said. We can't control where the audience are watching work online, but we can control the environment that we're presenting from. Take some time to record a bit, to try a bit, to have another go, to play it back, to listen to it again, um, you know, to, to do that thing of going, you know, what worked in this? Be really super critical. Don't, you know, watch, uh, watch your extract through. Watch yourself the first time. Then the second time, watch what's going on behind you. Then the third time, listen to it on headphones and listen not to your words, but listen to what's going on in the sound world behind you. And be really, really deliberate, really uh, hypercritical, because what seems like a minor inconvenience in a Skype conversation or a Zoom call, if you're putting that up on work, uh, up online as work which is being shared with the world, it will compromise the experience of the audience. It will compromise their ability to engage without distraction with the work that you're sharing. And these are not complicated things to get right. They're just things that need a little bit of time and a little bit of care and a little bit of thinking about. So be intentional, record a little excerpt first, test out your framing, test out your sound, think about what people can see behind you. Gonna move on now if that's okay. We're now getting on to part three, um, rustling papers, part three. Um, we're gonna think about the basic requirements for live streaming, the technical nuts and bolts, okay? So what do you need? What are the things that can help make this work for you? Um, this next bit, we're going to look in at, um, just bring that back up, we're gonna look at, so, um, basic requirements for live stream or pre-recording. We're then gonna look at some possible setups and then we're gonna look at some hosting platforms and we're on the home stretch. I know I've been talked an awful lot and I do want to leave some time for conversations, but I promise we're on the home stretch here. So um, so three three different things, basic setup for requirement, uh, basic requirements for live streaming or pre-recording. Looks like this, this list. Okay, so something to capture the image. This might seem obvious, but it's worth articulating this. If you're gonna live stream something, you need something to capture the image. You need something to capture the sound. You need an encoder, which effectively is a device which will take the sound and the image and convert it into a format that can be understood by the internet. You then need an internet connection to get it up there. And then you need a platform, somewhere to share it, a streaming platform. Now, with these things, there everybody has at their disposal, or almost everybody has at their disposal, something, a single device which has in it something to capture this 
picture, something to capture the sound, something to encode it, an internet connection, and a streaming platform. And it comes in the shape and form of this, your mobile phone. Most people, if you have a smartphone and you think about what the smartphone can do, it has a camera, it has a microphone, it has a computer built into it, which is designed to encode sound and video into a format which computers understand. It has a network connection, yeah, and it is able to connect to streaming platforms, to hosts online. So everybody, right from the get-go, has a tool at their disposal, or forgive me, not necessarily everybody, but a, you know, a vast number of people have an easy um, to use tool at their disposal that does all those five things immediately for them. Yeah? So starting with this, where do we go next? And when we're wanting to think about where we go next from this, how do we take this and transport this from a basic um, first attempt at sharing work online into something which is a little bit more engaging, a little bit more compelling, a little bit better suited to what we're trying to share. You just want to um, think about what you can do to elevate this a little bit. So this, uh, you know, this first device, perhaps the next thing to do is think about a microphone. Because if you're positioning this out in front of you, we've talked about getting it to eye level, which is good, we're doing that. The image on these will be great. The microphone is designed for this, yeah? The microphone is designed to be in this proximity. So when your camera is over there, the quality of audio that you're going to be getting isn't necessarily going to be as, um, engaging or as compelling as it could be. So finding a mechanism, finding a tool which enables you to, uh, to bring the sound world closer to the source. Now, what I'm doing at the moment, I'm using a little, little Lavalier mic, just clipped on here, which if I tap, 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 I should be able to hear. Um, so that's bringing the sound, not from the camera, but it's bringing it closer to me where I am. Now, these companies, Rode, Zoom, and Sure, all create very cost effective, um, very simple mics that plug into phones, whether it's a, 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 you know, an Apple or I believe other phones do exist. Um, uh, whatever sort of phone it is, there will be a device, which, uh, you know, a mechanism which will allow you to get a simple microphone, uh, perhaps which is a clip on mic, perhaps it's a mic which just is a, a sort of a, a mic which will bring the sound world a little bit closer. So something which is just, uh, you know, more, more designed for recording the world around it rather than necessarily the mic that you would get in your phone already. So a mic is a good first step at just elevating the work that you're doing. Next simple thing, tripod. If you can put this on something which gets it up to eye level, which holds it still, which gives you the a look and feel which is more intentional, then that's a winner. It sounds again like a minor thing, but everybody has something at their disposal that can help them do that, but most people don't necessarily think about it. If you can sit down at a table, get a box of cornflakes out, stand up on top of the box of cornflakes, two tins of beans, you can prop your phone up in between it, and that's holding it at eye level, and it's holding it still, and it's helping you frame a shot intentionally. Yeah. So just thinking about what's there in the world around you, thinking about what you can use to try and get that sort of that stability that you might want to um, uh, want to build in. Now, obviously, we're capturing the sound, we're capturing the vision, we're thinking about encoding it. Um, we're thinking then about uh, an internet connection and sharing it, and we'll come on to that in a minute. I want to just talk first about a few different ways of getting from this as your very first entry level. We've talked about bringing in a different mic. The next thing to think about is if you want to be bringing in more sound, so perhaps you want your sound effects playing in the background as well. Perhaps you want a different mic that you're already using. Um, you can get from somewhere like Focusrite, top of the list there, a sound card, which will plug straight into your phone. Roland do them as well, second on the list there. Um, a sound card that will plug directly into your phone to give you the option to bring in multiple sound sources. So all the time still, we're just filming on our phone, 
balanced on our cornflakes box, propped up with a can of beans, we're still filming there. But what we're doing now is we're controlling the sound world in a more deliberate way. So perhaps we've got a, another sound source, perhaps we've got another laptop running, which perhaps is running QLab or something like that, you know, a piece of theatrical software, which allows us to trigger effects, to play background sounds, things like that. If you get a sound card and you can get, you can pick up something for, you know, for 99 pounds, almost certainly, perhaps even less, um, which will allow you to take multiple sound sources in and plug them straight into your phone. That's a very, uh, you know, a, quite an easy step up to being a little bit more in control of the world that you're building, the tools that you're using to build that world. Um, next step after that, perhaps, is exploring something like a Nevo camera. And um, this is where you're still, this is uh, Mevo.com, M-E-V-O.com up on screen there. Mevo is a new entrant and there are a few of these sorts of things out there. It's a new entrant into this sort of sharing your work online. It's worth after the session having a little look on their website. Um, they have created a camera which is a single device but what it does is it has a super wide lens with a super high resolution camera behind it and an iPad or an iPhone app, I think an Android app as well, which allows you to basically crop into that frame. So when you're sharing your work online, it will recreate how, um, the, the effect of having uh, you know, four or five or six or seven cameras. So you can program it to track you on screen. You can program it to pick out different parts of the screen. So if you imagine that you're set up facing a stage and you know that you're, you've got one actor working over there, you've got another one working over there, you want a sort of wide shot that encap uh, encapsulates everything. With the Mevo camera and this, the app that supports it, you can program those in. So while the show's running, you're literally sat there on your phone tapping, okay, go to shot one, go to the wide shot, go to shot three, track that shot and you drag the frame across the screen as a person's walking across stage, you can follow them. Now, what this mechanism does is it allows you with one single device to recreate that sense of a multi-camera shoot. So we're talking about stepping stones up in sharing of your work in your practice. We're starting out very simple. We're building in then an external microphone to improve that. We step up then to a sound card that allows us to play in some sound effects. We then maybe move on to thinking about using something like a Movo camera that gets multiple options. Or if you look at that Roland website address, they have a piece of software, which is a download, a free download called, if I can remember this, um, I can't find it in my notes now, uh, called Four Times Camera Maker. And what that does, if you're in a company and you have other people that you're working with, it allows you to take your phone and their phones and everyone else's phones and join them together and make them effectively separate cameras within the same shoot. So you're streaming from one device, but all the other devices are positioned where you want them to around your work in your space. And you're able to, just as I was describing with the Mevo, go, yeah, cut to camera one which is, you know, is Bob's phone, which is set up over there. Cut to camera two, which is, uh, uh, you know, Cara's phone, which is set up over there. Cut to camera three, which is Tony's phone in the control room at the back. But they're all just phones. It's all just the kit that you've got already. But what you're doing is by putting a little app on it, joining them up over a Wi-Fi network, it extends the creative possibilities for how you're sharing your work with people. And the important thing to say about this, this is the main reason for doing this, is that if you think about how an audience experiences work, they're making deliberate decisions when they're watching. They're sat in an auditorium and they're watching a stage. They're making deliberate decisions, some of which are triggered by the way the lighting's working, some of which is triggered by the way the directing's working, but the attention is being focused into different areas at different times. And as an audience member, they're making those decisions. But when you're working online, the days of it being okay to just lock off a camera at the back of an auditorium and expect people to engage like that. That's long, long gone now, long gone now. We need to borrow from the vocabulary of film and television when we're thinking about this. And we need to be able to help. Um, we need to be making those decisions for people. So we're helping them engage with work in a way which is 
um, is more compelling and more engaging on a small screen. So it might be that you start with a context shot, you're setting the scene. You might then want to zoom in close. So you come up close to, uh, you know, to, uh, to bring in that sort of, that bit of intimacy um, with, with a performer. And as a, a practitioner, as a director, whatever your discipline is, you're making a set of deliberate choices about how people are viewing the work. So you're helping work, you know, work with the, the resources that you have in your environment to make sure that regardless of the environment that they're in, they're able to look at the work and engage with the work in a way which is, is most transporting and transformative. So the next step up then, thinking about where we go to next from this, is that it might be that we want to do a multi-camera shoot as I am in this case. I have two cameras set up. I have one which is slightly wide and I have one which is um, zoomed in on me. What I neglected to do before we started talking was just double check which is which. So just excuse me a minute. I'm just gonna just go over here. Uh, you should still be able to hear me. I'm just going behind the camera. That one is, okay. So <laughs> I know now that if I look to this camera, pointing right at it. If I look to that camera very intentionally, I'm looking straight through the lens, straight to you where you are. Yeah. If I switch to that camera and I'm looking at the other camera still, although you can still see me on screen and to a certain extent, it doesn't matter so much in a wide shot, I'm not looking directly at you. I'm looking still at the other camera. If I cut back to this, you see the difference that we're talking about. So if you're recording stuff at home, if you're delivering stuff to camera, make sure you know where the lens is. If you're wanting particularly to be talking directly to the audience, make sure you know which lens you're looking down. Look right down the barrel of the lens, as they say. And that way, you're looking straight out of the screen at the person at the other end. Yeah. Um, when you're working with multiple cameras, and this Joyce, we've come right to the point in the presentation where I can tell you how I'm getting text up on screen. Um, when you're working with multiple cameras, you're gonna to have to think about somehow, some way of combining those signals um, in a way which allows you to switch between them. Now, what I'm using, hopefully can, uh, if I go to that camera, if I lift that up there, what I've got plugged into my laptop here is this little switcher, which is just a teeny tiny little desktop switcher. Uh, it's called an ATEM Mini, um, which I'll put the link up for uh, that in a moment. Um, that's not there. Uh, yeah. uh, an ATEM Mini, it's produced by a company called Blackmagic Design, and um, it's A-T-E-M. Um, the company blackmagicdesign.com. They make cameras and software and switchers and all sorts of things. And this, what's remarkable about this switcher is that, and remember, this is not necessarily a first project out of the gate. This is, you know, something as you've tested, you've tried out your audience, you've worked out that there's, there's a way that you can make this stuff work for you. Um, this switcher costs less than 300 pounds which for a piece of kit, which allows you to plug in four different cameras, two different audio sources, it gives you the option to overlay text or graphics on screen. Uh, it gives you the option to uh, you know, cut straight to computer sources if you want to. So that's basically what's running on my iPad at the moment is just um, some text. But because of the way I've keyed the frame without getting too far into technical terminology. I've told the vision mixer that I want the text to appear on screen. It just gives me not only a range of creative possibilities, it gives me a range of technical solutions as well, all in a device that costs around you know, less, than, less than 300 quid. It's a very powerful um, vision mixer. But remember, most importantly, is that when you're doing this, is this thing of being able to go to close-up camera, to be able to do that thing of drawing in close, to get that intimacy, to bring your audience closer to the work. This is why you might want to go down the multi-camera shoot option. I'm aware that we're rapidly running out of time. So, oops, I have to stop doing that. Okay, rapidly running out of time. So, um, 
last couple of bits to think about. Um, encoder, I've talked about encoders. So if you think back, if you remember back to the, uh, the things that we need, something to capture the image, something to capture the sound, an encoder, an internet connection, and a streaming platform. Let's quickly touch on encoders. The encoder simply takes the um, signal, the sound and the image and converts it into a format which a computer can understand. Now, the ATEM Mini, the device that I'm just looking at, will do that for you. It will take the, an HDMI feed out of a camera or whatever your camera will send you, and it will convert it into a format that can be read by your computer, which I literally, when I plug this in, I go on Zoom, if I'm working in this context, and I go into my video options and I pick the camera that I want to use. So, you know, rather than using the, um, I'll show you this, the, the, the built-in FaceTime camera, which is the camera that's on my laptop just there, um, which obviously is looking a little bit at my nose and a little bit at the ceiling. Um, I'm telling it that I'm using a different video source. I'm using the um, Blackmagic Design there. And that gives me the option then of switching between my two cameras. Simple as that. Um, so that device is converting the feed from the camera into something the computer can understand. These two links that are on screen here, two pieces of software, OBS, that's uh, OBS, Open Broadcast Software. Um, uh, so obsproject.com and Wirecast. These are both, if you like, the next step in the encoding process. These are pieces of software which will allow you to tell the computer where to send the information. Yeah. So these are things which are enabling you to do that bit of going, right, I know that I'm going to send this to YouTube or I'm going to send it to Facebook or I'm going to send it to Vimeo and put into Wirecast what the source is, you know, where's the information coming from and where it's going to. So it's basically, it's giving you that destination. It's giving you that end point, that place that you want to be able to share the work. And OBS is a free download. It's a very powerful and effective piece of software, but it's available for free. It's an open source thing. Um, Wirecast allows you a few more options and possibilities, but it is a subscription or a paid for um, service. And you know, to be honest, it's not necessarily worth it unless you're doing an awful lot or you want um, some of the, uh, the facilities and the options that it has available. So OBS is a good starting point. It takes a little bit of getting your head around. It's not, you know, nine tenths of the software that's on the computers tends to be fairly intuitive. You should, you know, most of us as uh, IT savvy people will be able to open a Word document or a drawing package or, you know, most sorts of software and be able to navigate our way around with something like this the key thing that you have to remember is that you're taking a source and you're sending it to a destination so effectively once you've set up and we'll come on to this now once you've set up your um your stream on the hosting platform the final step of the encoding is telling the computer where to send it so where to, over the internet connection where to send it so the images, the text, the you know, video, the sound is all arriving at the right destination. So obsproject.com is a good starting point for that. Now, moving on um, and thinking about the, uh, the platforms that we're using to share our work. And this, I promise, is the final, final bit before um, we get into some questions, final bit. Think about the platforms where we're sharing our work. First thing that you want to do is you want to go full circle right back to um, the beginning of this conversation. Think about how you're wanting to engage with your audience. Where are they most likely to find the content that you want to share? So ask yourself that question first. If you have an audience, if you have a following already online, they are likely to be on Facebook, perhaps. They're likely to be on Instagram those sorts of places. Now, both of those platforms will allow you to stream work for free to audiences that already exist. To the audiences that you already have, that are already interested in what you're doing, you can use those platforms as a first step into sharing your work online. Now, key things to think about, television and film is that way around. Yeah. So when you're sharing work on Facebook or YouTube, 
you should film it this way around. If you're sharing work on Instagram, they like it that way around because they recognize that most people are viewing it on a, a device. So you get better real estate, visual real estate, if you film it that way around. So again, think about where your audience are viewing it. Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, TV and film format. Instagram, phone format. Um, with Facebook, with Instagram, with YouTube, you can film and share work live for free. So you can get it into your hands of your audience as quickly and easily. One restriction there is that YouTube won't let you stream live from a phone unless you've got a thousand followers. It's one of the, the restrictions they put in place, I think, to limit the amount of bandwidth they're spending on um, you know, people filming their cereal in the morning and that kind of thing, um, or whatever it is that people get up to online nowadays. But the, um, uh, so Instagram, Facebook will allow you to stream from a mobile device for free. YouTube, you can stream to free from a computer, from a laptop, that kind of thing, but not a mobile. Um, Vimeo is a platform, and I, this is the last bit that I really want to touch on. Vimeo will allow you to stream if you have a paid for account. But the advantage with using Vimeo as a paid for account is that it opens up the potential to start charging for your shared work. Now on Vimeo, you can, even on a relatively low tier account, you can upload work and make it available on pay-per-view. And Vimeo will take a little bit of a subscription. So if you've captured a piece of work and it's brilliant, you've got one of your, one of your plays, one of your, your pieces of work uh, available and it's, it's filmed in a way which actually you really want, you're really proud of it and you really want to make available to people, then Vimeo pay-per-view is a very easy and quite cost-effective way of doing this. If you jump up a level to their highest subscription, which is about 70 pounds a month, so you you really need to mean it. There's a mechanism there which allows you to pay, to charge for live streams. Now, this last week or so, I've been a digital producer for York International Early Music Festival. Normally, the festival takes place live. It happens over 10 days. It happens in multiple venues around the city. Thousands of people thousands of people come to the city for the early music festival we sell out venues there's four or five concerts a day there's a lecture program people travel from all over the world as do the artists and um, this year obviously none of that can happen for all the obvious reasons so what we did was we stripped it right back we have a venue that we're in control of that we can uh, provide a covid secure environment in so we brought in artists over a couple of weeks to film concerts to share online over a festival weekend to a ticketed audience who paid for a, um, a 30 pound festival pass that got them a whole weekend of content. Now we used Vimeo as a platform for this. And the main reason for doing this is that Vimeo allows you more control over where your content is seen. So we were able to say that only people who had a password for this page on this website were able to see that content. And what that meant was that we were able to sell tickets through our box office. We forgot, you know, full, fully functional box office. We were able to sell the tickets ourselves. We were able to direct traffic. So we were maintaining that data, that audience data, which is really crucial. We were able to direct traffic towards our website where people were able to access just by putting in their email address access content which they had paid to view within our environment within our control and some of that was pre-recorded stuff that had been edited that we streamed out live and some was actual live so on saturday night we had 12 singers socially distanced in the space and a camera crew of three plus you know, uh, live vision mix plus sound mix plus all the rest of it. And in a COVID secure way, we're able to run a live event for a paid for audience online in a way which was comparatively cost effective. And I say comparatively cost effective because the reality is, is that charging for live streams, if you're going to make them really secure, is 
actually quite an expensive way of doing it. This was sort of a, a workaround, but quite a quite a good workaround um, that worked worked quite effectively. And actually, we had for the Saturday night conference, uh, sorry, the Saturday night concert. Um, for the Saturday night concert, we had over five hundred people watching all over the world, all of whom had paid. 30 pounds for a festival pass to do it. And so whilst it didn't replace the audience for the festival, it did more than double the audience that would have fitted in the venue that night for that concert. So, you know, there's pros and cons there. Um, so look, we need um, some time for questions for sure. Thank you, Shazia, for the reminder in the thing. That is pretty much all the notes I've got anyway. Um, I'm sorry, some of that was a little bit rushed. Um, there's an enormous amount of potential in this, in sharing your work online. There are new audiences there that haven't been explored. There's new ideas, new mechanisms, new ways of sharing work that haven't been explored. As creative practitioners, there's a whole world of uh, interesting possibilities there. Key bit of advice is grow organically. Start as simply as you can with this. Take the next step, put a microphone, grow, share devices, get multiple shots, bring in additional cameras, switches, when you're ready for it. Grow your digital practice at a pace which is right for the work that you're doing, but always, always, always come back to those first questions that we started out with. Think about your audience, think about where they're viewing the work, how are they engaging with it, and what are you wanting to say to them? And as long as you start interrogating those sorts of questions, you'll be in a good position to, to create some really compelling and rewarding work online. Right, I will stop now um, and look to some questions. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Ben. Um, I think it starts off with Joyce, if you go a bit up. She says, it feels like theatre makers are trying to rapidly learn to be filmmakers or broadcasters. From your experience, have you, from your experience, have you observed any unique qualities or skills theatre makers bring to making dig digital work that filmmakers don't? Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is a really important point, actually. And um, it's some, it's, it's, uh, you can get yourself into a whole world of pain if you bring filmmakers into live work. This is just a, a slight note of caution. Filmmaking is a very different discipline because effectively what happens is that there, um, you know, the, the priority is capturing a scene multiple times, potentially with the same kit over and over and over and over to get the right number of shots in the right way to, um, to, to create something which seems like a seamless narrative in an edited form. Now, it's absolutely okay to do that with sharing work online. It's absolutely okay to do that with live work, but if you are working with performers that are used to performing live, if you're working in a way potentially in the future as we will, with audiences in the space, you need to be thinking about working with people who understand the theatre aesthetic, who understand the theatre um, discipline, who understand the sanctity of the live event. I was on the peripheries of a, you know, what was a, just an awful, awful experience for the company involved. Um, Streetwise Opera, a few years ago, uh, got snapped up by the BBC to share the St Matthew Passion on telly. Um, they were going to do a live stream and um, it was going to be you know, four subtle cameras, a table with a little vision mixer, um, sharing the work online. BBC came in, they brought two articulated lorries of equipment that parked outside the, the venue. They brought 10 camera operators who were all people who were used to filming uh, for broadcast, but in a way which was much more, much less live and much less sensitive to a live audience. And actually the performers and the audience just felt a little bit trampled over by that mechanism, by those tools. So it, I think really, you know, you have to make sure that you are working with people who are sensitive to the, the context is the key thing to say on that. But try and keep alive what makes theatre special try and keep alive that stuff, which is that liveness of it, 
that stuff which is the tools and techniques that we use in theatre that separates it from film. It's still a very different thing. Watching theatre on screen is still a very different experience to watching film. And it's a little bit sort of, it's a little bit intangible in some respects, but it's, you know, it's definitely there. What's next? Is as we are learning to become filmmakers, can you recommend best editing software? Yes, editing software. So um, there are loads of stuff. There's loads of software available for free online. You can upload videos to a website and it'll let you do a very basic um, uh, edit. If you type in free video software online, it will bring you up 10 possible options. They are basically fine, but they all have restrictions and they all have sort of complications with them. What I would advise is that there is editing software on your phone, almost certainly. There's editing software on your laptop, almost certainly that comes free as part of the bundled package. So, you know, it again will perhaps be quite restricted or quite limited in what it allows you to do. It might just let you sort of trim the beginning and ends of a bit of film or something like that. If you um, are familiar with something like Photoshop, then Adobe have a piece of software called Premiere, which you can get at a subscription, a monthly subscription rate. If you're a, an Apple person, then um, Final Cut Pro is a very, both Premiere and Final Cut Pro are very powerful pieces of software, but they both come at a cost. Um, so, you know, they allow you more creative control over your content, but either you pay a subscription or you pay to download the software. The software that I use and that I am very happy to recommend is a piece of software called DaVinci Resolve. This again is made by Blackmagic Design, who made the uh, the switcher that I showed you. DaVinci Resolve started its life as a basically as a, a piece of software that allowed Hollywood film um, producers to adapt the color within their their frame. So if they they wanted to make something look particularly wintry, they would just adjust the the view. So it, it's color grading. It started out as a piece of color grading software. Um, it's it's now a very, very powerful suite of video editing tools and it's available for free. It sounds like I'm doing a promotional um, spot for Blackmagic Design, but DaVinci Resolve, available for free. It's, um, uh, it is basically, it's, you know, Hollywood grade um, video editing software. It's easy enough to get your head into. It's easy enough to figure out what to do with it. There's lots of tutorials available and it gives you the back that creative control that you wouldn't have if you were working with a free you know, online something. So if you're looking for something free, check out DaVinci Resolve. Uh, I actually have Final Cut Pro and use that for years and years and years and have paid for it, but actually still prefer using DaVinci Resolve. Um, so yeah, free option, um, but powerful software, creative control. That's what you're looking for. Brilliant. Uh, another question is from Laura who says, do any platforms allow you to use music with a PRS limited online license? We are thinking we will have to host on our own website because no third party platforms seem to be covered. Okay, this is a absolute minefield. I, um, I went and I did a, a two and a half hour seminar on this a couple of weeks ago with the, the country's leading experts in the industry. And the conclusion that I came to at the end of the seminar was actually they, nobody really knows the definitive answers to this. I can see a lot of you shaking your head. So you've obviously had similar experiences. Now, the, the reality is, is that uh, YouTube and Facebook carry PRS licenses. So they are allowed to play back music on YouTube and Facebook that will cover, be covered by PRS. The problem is, is that that only covers the playback of it. It doesn't cover the usage of it. And so what happens is um, YouTube, particularly, YouTube's robots will listen all the time to what's being played. And if they think that there's a piece of music being used that shouldn't be, they will flag a warning on the account. Now, it might not have any consequences. It might just be that you're not allowed to monetize it, which means adverts won't run, which frankly is a bonus sometimes. It might be that it's not allowed to be played in certain territories, which might not be the end of the world. So it's worth, even if you're going to do something live, it's worth in advance uploading the audio content. This was the one tip that I came away with, which I think is really useful. It's worth uploading the audio content in advance 
and seeing what YouTube makes of it. Because if nothing else, what it'll do is it'll flag up this piece of music is copyrighted and it belongs to this author or it's in the control of this, um, you know, this, this library. You then, if you've got time, can contact them and go, I'd like to use that piece of, piece of music. They might say yes, they might say no. It's a, you know, there's a lot of very good pre-cleared sync music libraries online as well. So if you don't have a composer or you want something which sounds a bit like a song, you know, go up online, search out pre-cleared sync music, S-Y-N-C music. Um, and, you know, there, for a few dollars, you'll be able to download something which sounds like this, or it's a piece of that sort of music, or it has this mood or ambience about it. And, you know, that the quality of that stuff's getting better and better all the time. So pre-cleared sync music is your friend when it comes to that sort of thing. But the other, the other thing to do is just, you know, if you want to in advance, just upload the content. I had a ridiculous experience with um, uh, Mercury, the Mercury Theatre in Colchester. We stream their panto. They're in their giant tent um, uh, in the because uh, their venue is being renovated. They contacted six months in advance. They contacted Sony um, to ask if they could use a song from The Greatest Showman. Now, they probably could have figured out that Sony were going to say no. The reality is, is that the panto ran for you know two months, hundreds and hundreds of shows with the piece of music in it. A month after the run finished, Sony got in touch and said, uh, "No, you can't use the music." Now, of course, by that point, it's too late. But it did mean that when they re-showed the live stream at Easter, once lockdown had started, they thought, great family opportunity. Over 60,000 people watched it for over a week at Easter. Um, they watched the panto again. We had to cut out the song from The Greatest Showman, uh, which wasn't an easy thing to do. Um, you know what panto can be like. Uh, it wasn't an easy thing to do. But um, by that point, you know, They'd done the live shows and thousands of people had seen it and Sony just didn't get their act together quick enough to respond. So this is the problem with that sort of thing. It's a real minefield, I'm afraid. There's no simple answers. Thanks, Ben. We'll take the last three questions that are on the chat, just because we are running a bit over time. So the, oh, the last three questions I'll take is, any top tips for using green screen? Be really sure you have to, is the first top tip. Um, if you want to use green screen, there's a whole load of creative potential there. So the top tips are, if you're gonna use green screen, make sure you've got really good lighting at your disposal because the way the computer interprets green is fairly restricted. So if, let's say for example, I've got, for example, let's say I had a green screen behind me, I'm just cut back to that camera. If there was a shadow, yeah, you can see on the wall there, there's shadows forming. In a green screen world, those shadows would be a slightly different shade of green. And that would immediately cause complications for the processing in terms of getting those shadows taken out. So get good, consistent, flat light across your screen as well, your green screen as well. So you're going to need lights behind you as well as lights in front of you. Make sure your screen is flat as possible because similarly, if it has, you know, ruckles in it, um, is that a word, ruckles, rumples, whatever, you know, flaps and folds in it, that will, that will create shadow, light and dark as well. The other thing to think about, and this is when you're getting into your, it's something that you'll only notice when you're doing your editing, but if you get it right when you're filming, it will make an enormous difference. Think about what you're putting on the green screen and think about where the camera was when that green screen footage was filmed and try and put the camera that you're filming yourself on in the same relationship to that background image as it would have been when it was filmed. This is a little bit of a, a tricky concept to get your head round, but if you're showing on a green screen something where the camera is filmed up high and you're filming yourself down low, then you in front of this, the green screened content are just going to look wrong. It's just going to be wrong. So the closer you can get your camera to the same position as the content that was filmed on the screen, the better. You'll get a much more consistent, much more uh, believable uh, end result then. 
Uh, the other question is, what's the best way for audiences to contribute visually to a live event? Visually? Um, well, I think that was my question, Ben. I think yeah. what I really meant was we've had an event since lockdown that's um, had to go virtual, but looking ahead to when we can meet again, mm. we've been attracting people from different countries and around the world who would want to contribute. How can we get them... Once we can meet again, how can we have people, say, in America, contributing into our event? Yeah, great. This is a really this is a really important point because this is going to be our new reality for some time in the cultural sector. Is that we're going to move from online to hybrid fairly soon? I would have thought within this, you know, by the new year at the latest, we're going to see a new raft of what's going to be become hybrid events taking place where effectively during this time, in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of contexts, for all sorts of reasons, we've built new audiences. We've found new people who are interested in a new way of sharing our work and sending work in and being part of stuff. And when you're editing that and then sharing it, or you're doing it on Zoom or whatever the platform is, it's quite easy to have people in remote locations. With the hybrid events, what you're gonna to have to think about, the first thing to think about is that the audience in the room are gonna to have to be able to see that content as well. So it might be for a little while, we're seeing more use of screens in live performances. We're doing that thing of, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're, you're gonna to have to have two computers effectively running in an ideal world. One which is uh, with your cameras in the room, streaming the live content out. So you've got a live audience and live content, and that's being shared with the world online. And then you have another computer, which is connected maybe to a screen or a projector. And what that one's doing is it's bringing in content from contributors around the world and mixing it uh, to share with both the online audience and the live audience in the room. So we're splitting that signal to go some online and some on screen. So it's, it's it, you know, it's a new thing. We're going to have to be thinking in this kind of hybrid way. There's a lot of the mechanisms and tools and techniques that haven't quite been ironed out with that yet. But watch this space because it's almost certainly going to become more intuitive and more logical. But as practitioners, if we can think about how to really make uh, you know, make good creative play out of that. I think that's probably the first first challenge. The technical solutions will follow. Thank you, Ben. Do you think digital shows are here to stay even after we are safely able to return to venues? And what are your thoughts about a hybrid approach? Well, um, digital shows, I think, almost certainly will stay. I think we've been seeing a uh, the seed of change over um, not only the last few months, but I've been... You know, I've been doing this work for nearly 10 years now, and it is growing. It's growing slowly, but granted, it has seen a, you know, a, 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 a big sort of rocket jump off point over the last few months as people are trying to find new ways of engaging with audiences. And I think that's the crucial thing with this is that really we do the work that we do because we want to talk to audiences. We want to share our stories, our, you know, our, uh, our narratives, our, our content, our work. The reason that we do that is to is to reach out to people and if we've found a mechanism for whatever reason of being able to do that during this period why would we stop doing that i don't think that live work is ever going to go away i sincerely hope it's not i mean you know all, all my live work at the beginning of drop down uh, drop down lockdown dropped off a cliff um you know i was at a tour out i was about to go into a tech week for a show i had a whole summer of uh, festival work and events and things that all just fell by the wayside that will come back round, but it is likely to come back round because people are gonna recognize the advantages not only in building audiences, in sharing work more widely, but actually Harry, as you talked about, that thing of being able to bring in contributors from further afield to share in, um, in work as well. So I think there is gonna be something, um, uh, you know, something really exciting to explore there. And I don't think it's gonna go away. It's certainly gonna change. And it might be that actually, in the interim there's different experiences for different audiences and people will choose them won't they how they want to experience something if they can potentially brilliant thank you everybody um we're not going to have to take any more questions if you do have any questions please do email me and i can get them to ben and also we are having our production management training and all that information is available online as well so you can check on www.bdproducinghub.co.uk and yeah, any last thoughts, Ben? 
Uh, no, thank you all for coming. I'm very happy to be contacted. You can get to me through Chazio. Uh, if you come on the production management training and you want to talk more about this sort of stuff, then we will be doing a session on, on this for sure, um, somewhere in amongst that. Um, otherwise, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed this evening. I hope you've found something that's useful in that. Um, and good luck with it all. I look forward to thank seeing you. the results. Thank you so much, Ben. And thank you, everybody, again. I'm just going to let you all go and let you enjoy your rest of the evening. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>